So Tim, your turn. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm representing um, the Fraunhofer Institute IPA today. Um, we are actually a quite a big institute located in Stuttgart working on um, manufacturing, engineering, and automation in general. And I'm part of a smaller division based in Mannheim, and we're specifically focusing on medical technology, robotics, and automation in the clinical context. And today I'll present parts of our work on um, catheter interventions for, um, for neurovascular um, applications. And this is a joint work, work with um, two of my colleagues mostly. Um, yeah, so I might not be able to answer all of your questions, but I'll, I'll give my best. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to start by giving you a brief um, intro to the context. Um, we're focusing on stroke applications. So stroke, um, strokes are still one of the um, leading causes of death and disability worldwide, and um, it's expected to get worse and worse as our society is getting older and old, older, and more people will um, unfortunately um, have a stroke. Most common type of stroke is the so-called ischemic stroke, where a blood clot um, forms, or a blood clot, clot gets stuck in um, one of the vessels in the brain, and um, therefore some of the brain tissue doesn't get enough oxygen um, carried by the blood anymore, and um, the tissue dies over time. And therefore, it is, is very important to act very fast when you have a stroke and to, um, in the best case scenario, remove the blood clot and restore the blood flow. And the, um, one of the gold standard treatments nowadays is called mechanical thrombectomy. And essentially, that means that you insert small, um, very thin and long instruments in, um, in your thigh and move them through the vascular system all the way to the brain and um, try to remove the blood clot. And currently this is done manually um, by the surgeons and you can imagine the surgeon can only um, pull, um, push or pull on, the, on these small instruments and rotate them. Um, that's, it's a very, very difficult task, it's very time consuming. And therefore there's a, a recent trend towards robotic assistance and there are, I listed a, a, yeah, well, it was recently, this uh, Corinda's company was recently acquired by Siemens. So I tried to, to pick one German and one French. And the other one is Robocaf in, based in France. And so these companies are focusing on telemanipulation, kind of like the Da Vinci system, where you would have a, a control console. And um, with the joystick and the surgeon can uh, manipulate the, the catheters and guide wires and in kind of like with a master slave system. Our approach is um, to have a system where um, the navigation is assisted by a robotic um, device. And we want to use deep reinforcement learning for that device. And our vision is to one day be able to fully automate the navigation of the instruments all the way to the brain. And then the idea is that the surgeon would still carry out the actual intervention, but he would be assisted um, just in the navigation, which is a very stressful task. We want to use DRL because, um, yeah, as we saw before, it's very um, computationally efficient. So we hope, or we believe that it's actually possible to have a real-time controller. And we've also seen that DRL has been successfully used in um, applications uh, such as continuum robotics and, and hyper-redundant robots, mostly for the learning of uh, inverse kin kinematics. Um, so I'll just give you a brief overview of the system that we envision. We have about five, uh, five components. Um, it's supposed to be a closed-loop control. Um, first, we have our controller that would calculate um, motion commands for a robotic manipulator, the manipulator would then um, yeah, move the, the instruments. We have an imaging system that um, is basically, uh, is currently um, envisioned to be x-ray based, where we um, take a scan and then we can 
locate the, um, the current position of the instruments by a tracking system that is um, developed by our um, collaborators at Fraunhofer Mavis in Bremen. And um, there would also be a user interface that is not, um, it's not um, really defined what it would look like right now, but the idea is to give the surgeon the, um, the power to always over override the system. And all the communication is um, implemented via the open IGT link framework. Um, that's, I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail here, it's, it's basically just a, a standardized um, protocol for network communication. And the reason I'm here today is because we want to train the controller using SOFA, using simulated data in SOFA. So um, how, the way we do this is that we um, model the beam kinematics using the beam adapter plugin. And so that is right now, um, yeah, just one instrument. So we're modeling just the guide wire instrument and we're using rigid vessel walls just as a first simplification. And for the DRL library, we're using Coach. Um, and now the, the nice thing is that we have two frameworks that are open source that we can modify um, that we, in the case of the DRL um, library, we're just using it out of the box. And for so far, we just had to tweak it a little bit to make it accessible and we can develop our own system around this. And um, we wrote this environment wrapper, which is essentially just a translation unit that takes um, outputs from the DRL framework and translates them into um, meaningful um, inputs for SOFA and vice versa. Um, for those interested in using the um, heat deterministic policy gradient, um, algorithm, and um, we're using that to train our, our neural network. And the goal for our training is always to reach a target in a blood vessel phantom before a, a, a predetermined timeout. Now, um, now, now that we've trained this controller, we want to um, evaluate how well it performs. And for that, we're using 3D printed phantoms where we just it's a bit hard to see, but we, we um, just have a phantom with like a bunch of um, vessels. It's supposed to model a quite simple vascular tree. Um, that phantom again is rigid, and we're using a camera-based tracking to um, determine where the catheter, the, where the guide wire is in that um, vascular tree. And now we're feeding the tip position of our guide wire as well as the target position into the train controller. And the, the controller also gets um, information about the rotation of the wire from the um, guide wire manip manipulator, which is just a um, two degrees of freedom robot that we built in-house. Um, in and um, so then the controller would um, pass on commands um, to the manipulator, and those commands are just um, rotation and translation velocity for the manipulator. And as experiments, we um, wanted to see if it is possible for the controller to move the guide wire from a random starting point to a random target. And we first um, tried this in so far, so without the, the manipulator and the, the physical um, Vessel phantoms, it was just based in the simulation, and then we moved on to a setup um, as it is shown here. So, now first, proof of concepts, uh, proof of concept experiments in SOFA. We use a very um, simple phantom that you can see on the right side from you, <coughs> where you're sitting, and uh, we tried a, a bunch of different algorithms to see how well, um, um, how well we can train our neural network and um, to compare how well they perform. Um, as I said, the goal was to move from a random point to a random target. Um, success was defined as um, yeah, every episode in which the guide wire reaches the target before timeout, and we trained our neural network um, until the success rate was higher than um, 
the average of the following success, um, following episodes success rate. And as you can see on in the in the plot, um, it worked quite well. We got a success rate of about eighty five to ninety percent in so far. Um, learning took um, yeah, it was a bit more efficient for um, for the DDPG and. Uh, yeah, w if we added a, a few more algorithms yeah. to the DDPG. And um, so that, that basically told us, okay, we have um, sufficient proof that this is a feasible approach, and now we can move to the test bench. And uh, we also changed a few more things. Um, we used a more complex phantom. Um, again, we trained our neural network only in the simulation and then took the, the train controller um, and used it on the test bench. And um, since this is ongoing work and the results have just come in, um, I don't have any quantitative data right now, but I can show you a video. <laughs> and um, I hope it works. Okay, I'll um, just explain what you can see here. Um, so where the guide wire is right now, that is the starting point. In, in for this video, we just always moved it from a from one fixed starting point to a the target, which is over here, greenish point. And um, I hope people in the back can see this, but you have one field that says autonomous navigation and manual navigation over here. Especially in the in the, um, with not sufficient training, the um, controller wasn't able to navigate the, the guide wire all the way by itself. So we had to help it a little bit. But um, towards the end of the video, you can see with more and more um, training runs in the simulation, the controller manages to do it all autonom autonomously. And now you can see the video. It is struggling sometimes to be human. <laughs> and now this is um, after 5,000 runs, you see how it basically manages to, to get to the target by itself without any help from us. So yeah, like I said, these are um, just like some preliminary results, um, but it's really encouraging and we're really excited that this works, that we can use um, just so far and the simulation data that we generate in so far to um, train our controller. We didn't do any training on the test bench itself. It's all based on, on the simulation data. And I think that is very, um, very exciting actually. Because we thought we probably have to um, do a few training runs on the test bench before it works, but it's sufficient for now. So what is next? Um, of course, there are many open questions, many things that we still have to investigate. Um, there's um, variability in the patient vasculature, so we cannot only um, consider one fixed vascular tree. We have to also take into account that friction and elasticity of the vessel walls, um, they differ. Also, the, the vascular tree can be different. Um, and also, there's not just one guide wire that you use, but there's a variety of different instruments that you use. You, have, you sometimes even have three concentric instruments that you use for one intervention. Um, and the, the tips of these instruments are also formed in crazy ways, and there's so many different ones that you can use. So these are all questions that we want to, um, want to um, tackle now. Um, and also, we want to see how our neural network fares when we use a phantom that it hasn't learned before. So how well we can generalize the learning. And um, yeah, as I said, in general, just make the, the entire setup and the simulation more realistic. And um, also work on the robustness and um, realism of our SOFA simulation, which is quite simplified up to this point.
and um, for that we're also building a manipulator that would be able to move two instruments, so a guard wire and a catheter right now. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and um, if you have any questions, go ahead. Yeah, but <laughs> I must say it's uh, quite uh, quite exciting. Uh, again, uh, that's uh, what we said just uh, right uh, right now with Stefan. One year ago, we again we we met uh, also at the, uh, a bit before uh, the Sofa Week. Uh, that was actually actually the idea, and one one year after, you can already see the the result, which is super exciting, as you said. Uh, I, I don't know if it would be, it would be for because I, I maybe I, I would maybe you know present it or sell it as a the robot that will be able to insert the catheter whatever you want and however you want, but more, I mean, it's in a few hours, so it means for one specific actually patient, you could train your network also for this specific uh, this specific patient. So yeah, that's very, very interesting. Uh, so thank you. Uh, is there any question for, yes, you're ready to hand. Uh, it's awesome. I have about 50 questions, so I will only ask I imagine, yeah. two of them. Uh, what is DRL as a library? It's a DRL. Um, DLR or Trigger. So First, uh, the one you have at the left side of the yeah. pipeline, it's a, a machine. This learning. one, yeah. this like DRL. So DLR. this is just a deep reinforcement learning and we're using Coach. Um, this is the name of the library. It's just a Python based library that you can get from GitHub. So it's, it implements some particular. It has CMA. so it's a yeah it's it, it's a it has a implementation for especially for this algorithm, for the DDPG um, algorithm and also the hindsight experience replay and a bunch of others. Okay. So you can yeah it's a, it's a library with algorithms essentially. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah because I've never heard of it. So okay. it's interesting. Yeah, it's kind, um, of, kind of like OpenAI baselines and. Um, so you train your network knowing the three-dimensional uh, vascular network, right? That's how you train the network, the vascular. <laughs> yeah. Um, what happens, I think it's one of the points you put at the end of your talk, what happens if you slightly change the geometry of the vessels? Okay. Um, if you, if you yeah. Have any I would say uh, about the sensibility, sensitivity to it. Yeah, so the, the interesting part is that we actually don't know the vascular tree, so the, the controller doesn't know what the tree looks like. It just knows, it just has the tip position and the target, and um, then it's trying to, to learn how to get there. Um, so what, so I, I cannot like tell you exactly what happens, but what we've seen is that it's quite robust. So now we're, we're actually showcasing this at Medica Trade Fair right now in Düsseldorf, and um, you can move you can move the phantom around a little bit, and it'll still be able to to navigate <coughs> the target. So it's quite robust. Yeah. Surprisingly, we don't. I mean, <laughs> there's there many things to investigate. Still, yeah, but yeah, that's awesome. nice. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks. It looks really interesting. Uh, I'm having maybe a beginner question. So you mentioned this for uh, treatment of stroke, mm -hmm. uh, but, but you also mentioned that the artery size or diameter is like how much? 10 millimeters or for the? It varies. So the aorta is, I think, like about this big. All right. And um, then in the brain, you have like tiny vessels with mm -hmm. just like a couple of millimeters. In diameter. Okay, but in, in this setup, it was. Oh, setup. oh, in this setup, yeah. Um, so for for this in the, for this phantom, which was the first one we tried, it was 10, 10 millimeters. In the second one, um, it is. Uh, I would say it's about five, five to seven. I don't know the exact number, but it's. Yeah, okay, but seven. but you in general, it can be said that this is realistic. Um, it's it's so this is still um, idealized. So this is uh, so in in the body you would have um, varying. So like the the di diameter would vary gradually. Yeah. Um, so obviously you don't have that here, and you also sometimes go from really large vessels to really small ones, which makes it extremely difficult to like get to those branches. 
Um, so, yeah, so just that like I said, it was a beginner question for yeah. to kind of get the scope sure. of the question. Yeah. Great. Thanks. I have a, also a question. Uh, <coughs> I worked also a bit in uh, inserting, I mean, using Beam Adapter to insert I mean, in a different scenario. And uh, I suspect, like, when you do 5,000 simulations, sometimes the collision uh, model fails and, like, you actually go through the vessel, I guess, yes. should happen. Yes. So, yes. how do you deal with this? Do you just erase those cases? Um, yeah, I think right now what we do is we make sure that it's stable so that we can uh, like completely avoid um, that the, the, the catheter goes um, punctures through the vessels. And um, But it also, that, that's one of the last points I, I mentioned is that we want to work on making the simulation both robust and realistic because you can, when you, when you make the instrument very flexible, of course, um, it doesn't go through the wall anymore, but it's not realistic. So yeah, that is definitely one of the issues that we're working on right now. I know it's quite tricky to play with the, yeah, the collision yeah. parameters. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I just had a question because I, I noticed that your patterns are flat, which means that uh, I guess your viewpoint, like if you had a CR, for example, you can your viewpoint would be really on top of, of that. So that I guess the vasculature in the, in the brain must be quite like kind of amazed and free. And uh, do you know how this, uh, if, do you think that this would uh, affect a lot a uh, machine learning approach for, for learning how to steer the, the catheter fluid? Do so you mean that the fact that it's three dimensional, how it affects the machine learning? Um, right now, I don't think that it'll affect it. I mean, Everything in if you go go up one dimension, it would probably mean that it takes longer to learn. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, I don't I don't foresee any like major issues. Because uh, maybe I, I missed that part. But uh, you do you know the 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 position in three D of the catheter? Right now, we we're just um, working two D, but. Um, that's one of the future steps that we want to take. And we're just using 2D because um, it's much easier if you don't work with, if you just work with a camera instead of a, a Zulu. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's something that we want to do later on. Maybe next year. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs>